exploring how we can master ourselves by looking at how authors and experts say it is possible with your host, Shashiti Basu. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 94 of How to Be with me, Shashiti, as your timid presenter, guiding you through life's tricky topics and skills by reading through the best books out there. In this episode, we look at our environment around us, literally. Rewilding is a progressive approach to conservation. It's about letting nature take care of itself, enabling natural processes to shape land and sea, repair damaged ecosystems and restore degraded landscapes. Through rewilding, wildlife's natural rhythms create wilder, more biodiverse habitats. But the first step to this is actually noticing it. So how do we appreciate the nature around us? Here are de-stress and wellness coach Lillian Lati and Hannah Ross, who can be found on Instagram at Goddess Tarot Society on their thoughts. I value the importance of rewilding because it brings me back to my natural innate self and supports me against the effects of stress. Having suffered a burnout and stress-related health crisis many years ago that admitted me to hospital, I find that by immersing myself in nature helps to form a wonderful basis for my lifestyle and it also helps to reconnect me back to my well-being. Being in nature helps reset my nervous system, shifts me out of that fight, flight and freeze mode and moves me into that place of rest, calm and relaxation. This is why I value rewilding and nature. The most important thing about rewilding to me is that I feel more connected to myself, my soul, my intuition. When I'm out in nature, ideas flow much more abundantly to me. And the disconnect can often happen so softly that it's hard to notice when it's gone until I'm in a dire need to recharge my soul by getting out in nature. I find it difficult to gain the motivation to get out in nature during the winter months. I have though been fortunate enough to set up a job opportunity in the French Alps. So getting out into the mountain air to snowboard was definitely a fun and exhilarating way to dive headfirst back into nature during the winter. Our first book is from veteran journalist and author Simon Barnes, who wrote a weekly wildlife column in the Saturday edition of The Times until 2014, as well as being the paper's chief sports writer. After learning his craft writing for local newspapers in Surrey, he worked out of Hong Kong for four years and joined The Times on his return to the UK, writing in particular about cricket, football and tennis over a 32-year span. He is the author of some 20 books, most of them about wildlife or bird watching, a lifelong interest. These include the best selling How to Be a Bad Bird Watcher and Ten Million Aliens, a book about the entire animal kingdom. He contributes regularly to the RSPB magazine, Nature's Home, is a council member of the World Land Trust, which buys land for wildlife conservation in the developing world, a patron of Save the Rhino, and an honorary vice president of the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. He was awarded the Rothschild Medal for Services to Conservation. We're talking about his incredible book, Rewild Yourself, 23 Spells for Making Hidden Things Visible. It was an absolute pleasure to speak to, hence here is a snippet of our chat. But find the full interview on www.howtobe247.com or on the YouTube channel. I think the first reason is that there's a lot less of it than there was, and uh... More and more and more of us live in the cities. I think something like in the high 80% of us are city dwellers these days. And in order to find nature, you generally have to do something to make an effort to do so. And we're all so busy and it's all so easier and there are so many distractions and there are so many screens. So we just lose the habit of it. And that is a great shame 
not only for our own well-being, but also for nature itself. What we don't see, we don't value. Yeah, it starts off in a fairly straightforward way, and that is to say, this is my business. You make a mental effort to say, this is my business. It is part of me. It's my concern. I have my need to do something about it to acknowledge it, to make the experience uh, vivid and valuable. And the best way that you can do this is to start to learn the names. Don't expect to learn them all at once. But if you look at a butterfly, and it's one of the early butterflies in spring, and it's fizzing past very high, and it's white, and it's got orange tips to its wings, you can say, goodness me, that is a male orange tip. And uh, it's not the hardest thing in the world. And you have done something. You've therefore seen it better. You've established the beginnings of a relationship with it. You know some, You know his name. And uh, that is how it begins. It's your business. So learn the name. And everything starts from that. Do you want to hear the uh, most wonderful, brave thing I've ever done in my life? I was in yeah, a please. hut in Africa. No mosquito net. No nonsense like that. And the hut contained... As I came in, when I, with plenty of whiskey on board, came into my hut, half a mile away from the nearest hut, right in the middle of the bush, opened it up, and I counted them. All I could do was count them. 43 wolf spiders, varying in size across the diagonal to three to six inches. I went to my bag and I had a wholly unnecessary and tautologous gulp from my duty free. Then I pulled the sheet over my head in cowardly fashion and slept the sleep in the just until the morning. It's, uh, there was no other option. You can't sort of go rambling across the African bush in the middle of the night because you're uh, uh, worried about the spider. Things far more dangerous than spiders out there. I did the only thing I could do, but I have uh, prided myself on my bravery ever since. They just give us the creeps. Uh, and I think both spiders and snakes, because they move, in a way that doesn't seem quite right. Spiders have far too many legs, and the way they glide over, uh, over there, they look bad enough when they're standing small. When they start to move, that gives one the shivers. And snakes, uh, not, not to me, but to many people, the way, the unearthly way they move, they haven't got any legs at all, and yet they still move. How do they do it? doesn't seem right. And that, I think it's that sort of, that's what gives them the creeps rather than the fact that, uh, you know, some of them can bite and some of them are poisonous and some of them are even deadly. It's not a logical thing. You don't say, I'm, it would be more logical to be frightened of guns or of 10-ton trucks. But it's something in our atavistic nature say, that doesn't feel right. I feel frightened about it. And in fact, it's a way of being more in contact with nature than anything else. It's a fact that we still have these atavistic responses because nature is still very much a part of us. So we should kind of, in a way, pride ourselves on it and uh, then move on and concentrate on the things that we find prettier and uh, are more exciting. Indeed, it's fair and logical that, that we do it. And the, the, again, the atavistic revulsion we have at droppings is a wholly sane and a healthy one. Because these things are dangerous, if you uh, get them into your system by any way, they can carry bad stuff. And so our bodies know that, and they make us a, a yucko response, which is, again, basically a good thing. However, as you get interested in what's going on, you want to say sort of who's been where and come across a, a little pile of currants if you're, when you're having a walk in a local wood. And that's not disgusting. You say, oh, hello, we've got deer here. I wonder what kind of deer is that? If they're small, it's probably a suburban munchie. If they're a little bigger than the currants, more like raisins, well, maybe it's when we're talking about red deer here. So that's kind of interesting to know. The red deer are not going to kind of flaunt themselves in front and say hello there, but they will leave a little calling card. And if you've got eyes in your head, you will say, oh, hello, that's interesting. And you look around for the foot links, prints are little slots that look like two almonds together. And you say, hello there, we have deer in this wood. The book is a compelling call to action for people to reconnect with nature and rewild themselves to live happier, healthier lives. In the book, Barnes argues that the modern lifestyle has caused a rift between humans and nature, leading to physical and mental health issues that can be traced back to our disconnection from the natural world. The book is divided into two parts, with the first part exploring the reasons why we need to rewild ourselves, and the second part providing practical steps that we can take to achieve this goal. Barnes makes a compelling argument that the loss of connection to nature 
is one of the greatest challenges facing human beings today, and that it has far-reaching consequences for our health and well-being. In the first part of the book, Barnes explains how the modern lifestyle has contributed to a disconnection from nature. He points out that we spend most of our time indoors, surrounded by technology and man-made structures, and that this has led to a growing disconnect from the natural world. Barnes argues that this disconnect is at the root of many of our health problems, from depression and anxiety to heart disease and obesity. The author says we're not just losing the wild world, we're forgetting it. We're no longer noticing it. We've lost the habit of looking and seeing and listening and hearing. We're beginning to think it's not really our business. We're beginning to act as if it's not there anymore. We begin with beautiful butterflies. There are 59 species of butterfly regularly seen in Britain, so it starts with recognising the top five varieties. The first one is the small white, often disparagingly known as the cabbage white. You may also find a large white. Then there are three colourful butterflies, all equally keen on Baudelaire's, also known as the butterfly bush. Let's start with a small tortoise shell. The small tortoise shell is a warm orange, but the leading edges of the wings carry a bar of alternating black and yellow. The next butterfly to look for is the peacock. On a rich red background, four mad eyes stare back at you. Mimicry in butterflies and many other beasts is fascinating, bewildering and sometimes close to hallucinogenic. You can find stunning examples of this in the rainforest and in anyone's back garden. The final one is a red admiral, which has shining black wings picked out with white and red. So let us move on to the magical sixth, the special one. It doesn't appear often at all. Last time it made an appearance in abundance was in 2009 and it is the Painted Lady. Painted ladies are powerful creatures that cross the channel on a routine basis. They're an emblem of strength, strength of body, strength of purpose, and there they are in the back garden drinking deep of the Baudelaire, just another miracle of everyday life. So take these six butterflies into the summer with you, and your summer will be richer. As you do so, you'll find yourself looking at other butterflies, and that's when you realise that your brain is getting wilder. Barnes also examines the history of our relationship with nature, highlighting the fact that humans have evolved in and around the natural world. He argues that our bodies and minds are designed to function in harmony with nature, and that this connection is essential to our health and well-being. In the second part of the book, Barnes offers practical tips and advice for how we can rewild ourselves and reconnect with nature. He encourages readers to spend more time outdoors, to engage with the natural world through activities like hiking, bird watching and gardening, and to learn about the natural history of their local environment. Barnes also offers advice on how to make small changes in our lives, such as reducing our use of plastic and other materials that harm the environment, and choose more sustainable and eco-friendly products. He says, when you have waterproof trousers on, you are the master of the universe, lord of the weather, and you are in possession of a visa that allows you to enter unknown lands, metaphorically. He even says, turd awareness enriches your life. Turds are best pursued in areas that aren't ruthlessly crisscrossed by dog walkers and their accompanying turd manufacturers, but it's always worth keeping your eye open for something less predictable, like the scattering of pellets that tell you that there are deer here, living their secret lives, keeping out of everybody's sight, everybody's sight but yours. Many wildlife organisations offer evening bat walks on which you can listen and quite often have a go with a bat detector. You can check out your local county wildlife trust or look for a local bat group through the Bat Conservation Trust. This is in the UK, of course, but I'm sure there's equivalents in other countries too. Throughout the book, Barnes draws on his own experiences to illustrate the benefits of rewilding ourselves. He shares personal anecdotes about his own connection to nature, including his experiences as a birdwatcher and his love of the English countryside. He also provides scientific evidence to support his argument, citing studies that have shown the benefits of spending time in nature, such as improved mental health and reduced stress levels. One of the key messages of the book is that rewilding ourselves is not just about protecting the environment, but also improving our health and well-being. Barnes argues that by reconnecting with nature, we can find a sense of purpose and meaning in our lives, and that this can have a profound impact on our mental and physical health. And whilst people have an aversion to snakes, there is something incredible about the fact that there are snakes six feet long slithering across the British countryside, 
able to hide in plain sight. Britain is a bit too cold for most reptiles, which is why we only have six species. Studying British reptiles is a bit easier than being an entomologist, who has a choice of 20,000 British species. Three of these British reptiles are snakes, grass snake, adder and smooth snake. Only the adder is venomous. Then there's the common lizard and the sand lizard. The last is the traditional teaser, the slow worm, which had no legs and is a reptile, but it's not a snake. It's a lizard that happens to have no legs. He also talks about the loss of an entire sense and how to get it back again. Life in cities would be impossible if we didn't. If we didn't edit out the roar of traffic, we would be unable to cope. We have become so efficient at this that the sounds of the wild world hardly get through at all. Well-researched science proves beyond all doubt that the sounds of nature are good for us in all kinds of calming, enriching and fulfilling ways. But even when there is birdsong all around us, we can't hear it. So here are five bird songs to watch out. Number one, the robin sings for most of the year in the UK. It's a pretty song, thin and musical. Number two, the great tit. These birds make lots of noises. They do it to announce the start of spring. Number three, the wren. These birds are one of the smallest birds in Britain and one of the loudest. Number four, song thrushes. Love repetition above all else. And number five, the blackbird's song is a simple, gorgeous, laid-back fluting. In conclusion, Rewild Yourself is a timely and important book that offers a compelling argument for why we need to rewild ourselves and reconnect with nature. Barnes' message is both urgent and optimistic, highlighting the challenges we face as a society, but also offering practical steps that we can take to improve our lives and the health of the planet, because it must be for anyone who is concerned about the state of the environment and their own well-being, and who is looking for practical advice on how to make a positive change. Our final book is from George Monbiot, who is a trained zoologist and has worked as a nature journalist as well as for environmentalist organisations. He has long been based in the United Kingdom and is a regular contributor to The Guardian. Feral is both an analysis and a manifesto. Here he is speaking to Penguin. I started work on Feral because I just could not take it any longer. I was banging my head against the wall. I couldn't stand those conversations which are confined to the three R's of recipes and renovations and resorts. Uh, I, I couldn't stand just running only to keep fit, pursuing only things I couldn't see, watching the seasons cycling past without ever really belonging to them. And it was driving me nuts and I couldn't quite work out what it was until I realised that I was ecologically bored. That, that we all carry in us a package of genetic memories which are the result of our evolutionary history when we evolved alongside elephants and lions and saber-toothed cats and giant aurochs. We evolved in very thrilling and very dangerous times and we acquired a, a set of, 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 of psychological weapons which allowed us to get through that and, and our fight-or-flight responses our ability to cope with great stress and great excitement. Uh, and those don't really have an outlet these days, or not not outlets which aren't dangerous and, and damaging to society. Uh, and I, I found myself scratching at the walls of this life, looking for a way out into a wider space beyond. And I think I've found it, and it's called rewilding. Now, the rewilding that interests me is of two kinds. What One is the literal physical rewilding of the natural world, the mass restoration of ecosystems. Uh, there are very large parts of less fertile lands now being abandoned by farmers as farming concentrates on, on the more fertile places. And that, I believe, gives us a great opportunity to do a mass restoration, to start pulling down the fences, blocking up the ditches, reintroducing the, some of the missing plants and animals, not, not trying to recreate a primordial wilderness, but to allow the ecosystem's dynamic interactions to resume and then stand back, stop managing, stop, abandon this whole notion of stewardship that we've got to keep managing it in order to look after nature. Nature's very good at looking after itself. It can create on both land and sea some much more thrilling and engaging ecosystems than those with which we're now familiar today. And alongside that, I want to see, if we choose it, and I would certainly choose it, 
a rewilding of our own lives, a reintroduction into the ecosystem, not just of our missing plants and animals, but of people as well, if that's, if that's what we choose. And that comes about partly by having those more thrilling places, but partly also by having the knowledge and the excitement which allows us to re-engage with them in a different way. And to give you just one very small example, or very big example perhaps, um, in both Europe and the Americas, our, our forest ecosystems were basically elephant-dominated um, until a very short time ago in ecological terms. Uh, in Europe, straight-tusked elephants were the dominant species in the forests, very, very large elephant species, like the Asian elephant, but bigger. And, and our trees still carry the adaptations required to withstand those, those animals. And doesn't that just open the world up and make it so much more interesting that you realise that in every park, every avenue, every leafy street, you can see the shadows of the great beast with which we evolved. Paleoecology, the study of past ecosystems, which is so crucial to understanding our own, feels like a portal to an enchanted kingdom. It opens up the mind. And that, to me, is, is, is a lot of what rewilding is about. Monbiot's book presents a thought-provoking manifesto advocating for the resurgence of wildness in both the natural world and human existence. The central argument posits that humanity's historical inclination to dominate nature must yield to a more harmonious coexistence to restore balance between humans and the broader natural realm. The author commences by tracing the evolution of rewilding, a concept originating in the 1990s and gaining contemporary traction. Rewilding is defined as a process of restoring ecosystems to their natural states by reintroducing missing species, eliminating non-native species, and permitting nature's intrinsic processes to unfold. It underscores the pursuit of ecological balance and biodiversity rather than the mere creation of wilderness for its own sake. The essence of genuine rewilding is a simple one, allowing these spaces to flourish naturally rekindling our sense of wonder and alleviating our ecological ennui. Monbiot's exposure to the gold mines of Brazil in 1989 while working for an environmental organisation was an eye-opening experience. Witnessing vast tracts of the Amazon rainforest raised for easier access to gold-rich river sediment, accompanied by rampant violence, deeply affected him. Over six months, more than 1,500 miners were shot in confrontations linked to gold supplies and mining companies. However, the indigenous Yanomami tribes bore an even graver toll. Approximately 15% of the Yanomami succumbed to diseases brought in by the miners, lacking immunity. Many others perished from violence and Yanomami villages were obliterated. Monbiot contends that rewilding is essential because the current conservation model, focusing on specific habitats and species, falls short. He advocates for a holistic approach that recognises ecosystems as whole and allows nature's course to unfold. He provides examples illustrating the success of rewilding in rejuvenating deteriorated ecosystems, such as the reintroduction of wolves to the Yellowstone National Park leading to a resurgence in biodiversity. The author posits that rewilding is not only vital for ecological well-being, but also for human well-being. He argues that our disconnection from nature underlies various societal issues, including depression, anxiety and obesity. Reconnecting through rewilding, he suggests, can enhance our mental and physical health. Monbiot offers a glimpse into the Maasai tribe in Kenya, highlighting their spontaneous decision-making. For instance, he introduces Maasai warrior Toronke, who on a whim could decide to run 35 miles to another village simply to visit a friend. Monbiot acknowledges that rewilding faces significant challenges, including resistance from those who fear the return of dangerous animals like wolves and bears. He contends that such concerns are largely unfounded and that these animals can coexist with humans without posing a threat. Additionally, economic interests such as farming and forestry industries may resist rewilding. Nevertheless, he argues that the long-term benefits outweigh the short-term costs. The book recounts the discovery of distinctive six-inch wide three-pronged footprints during an archaeological dig attributed to the crane, 
a once common bird in the Mesolithic period that went extinct in Britain in the 17th century. These birds, towering at four feet with an eight-foot wingspan, engage in captivating courting dances. Subsequently, efforts to reintroduce cranes in Britain began in 2009, establishing a breeding colony in Somerset. The author explores the role of technology in rewilding, advocating for its potential to enhance efforts such as wildlife, monitoring using drones or resurrecting extinct species through genetic engineering. However, he cautions against over-reliance on technology, emphasising the need for balance so we don't have a Jurassic Park type of affair. Monbiot addresses the impact of rewilding on human civilization, asserting that it signifies a transformation rather than the demise of civilization. He envisions opportunities for sustainable agriculture, forestry and tourism in wilder landscapes and a chance for human communities to reconnect with nature and one another. He dispels a romantic notion of early societies living in perfect harmony with the environment, citing studies revealing the significant impact on local wildlife. Historical population limitations in the British Isles further underscore the necessity of technologies and farming practices that sustain today's populations. Monbiot concludes by urging readers to embrace rewilding as a solution to our environmental and societal challenges, emphasising its necessity and desirability as a pathway to a more sustainable and fulfilling future. He writes, We can live in a world of wonders if we rediscover the sense of awe and reverence with which we once regarded the earth. So to sum up, Rewild Yourself by Barnes explores the importance of reconnecting with nature and rewilding ourselves to live more fulfilling lives. Barnes argues that modern society has disconnected us from the natural world, leading to various physical and mental health problems. He advocates a return to nature, not just to protect the environment, but also to improve our own well-being. Throughout the book, Barnes shares personal anecdotes and scientific research to support his message, ultimately encouraging readers to take action and rewild themselves. Feral, Rewilding the Land, the Sea and Human Life by Monbiot is a thought-provoking book that challenges the traditional conservation model and advocates for a more holistic approach to restoring ecological balance. Monbiot's argument is well supported by scientific evidence and his passion for rewilding is contagious. He believes we'll need to set aside certain large expanses of non-productive land and let these areas return to nature. This means reintroducing large animal species, including wolves, bears and wild boars, to live there. Beyond this, we shouldn't intervene. Nature should be left to run its course. But these areas should also be open to people who wish to visit and reconnect with the wild. I love the idea of rewilding. I think it's necessary, as we seem to have lost our roots to nature. How about you? Do you think rewilding is necessary? Let us know. Please join in on the conversation by following at how to be 24 7 on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook and subscribe on the podcast which can be found via www.howtobe247.com. We have Spotify polls so feel free to send your responses there too. You can even check out all our exclusive unseen bonus material from every single interview or for the price of a coffee on both Spotify and Patreon under the name Behind the Scenes exclusives from the How To Be Books podcast. All the latest ones are on Spotify, while more than 30 exclusives are on Patreon. Sign up to be part of the movement. Please do leave a review if you found this helpful and you want to be featured. And remember to check out the website. This week we spoke to Professor Hakim Adi about his Wolfson Prize nomination, as well as being made redundant by the University of Chichester, despite being the first black professor in the UK teaching African and Caribbean studies. We also spoke to a number of publishing people regarding the gamification of reading and whether this is the case at the moment on all the social media platforms. Don't miss out on all the important things happening in the world of literature and the intersection of society. Before we go, here is coach Jenla Marinelle, founder of Wildfire Walks on Her Thoughts. See you next week. We've tamed ourselves, and in doing so, we've lost ourselves. For me, the importance of rewilding isn't just about protecting and restoring the planet, or even about connecting more deeply with nature. It's about remembering who we really are, or what it means to be human in this world. 
My passion is helping women rewild themselves, gathering around the fire, remembering old ways, tuning into the seasons and cycles both inner and outer, remembering what it is to be wild, and then taking that wildness back out into the world we live in. For me, rewilding is about, yes, connecting to the planet, connecting to nature, supporting the planet to be its most natural self in its most natural state, but it's also about applying that to ourselves, being in our natural wild state. <laughs>